Welcome to Q&A, a program that raises questions and provides answers on issues of importance to the community. Today's topic is the Equal Choice legislation passed in August 2006 that provides increased home care services for the elderly and disabled. Our host is Sally Hoyt, Senate President and 14-year member of the Massachusetts Silver Legislature. Sally also was a 12-year member of the Reading Board of Selectmen. And now, the discussion. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have two very distinguished guests with us this afternoon who's, who are going to speak on the Equal Choice Bill. And I think many of us uh, need to know what that uh, represents. And we have two people here who are going to give us the answers. On my uh, near right, uh, left, sorry, is um, um, Anne Norman, uh, Executive Director of Home Health Care, and um, Dan O'Leary, Executive Director of Mystic Valley Elder Services. And we welcome you here today, and we hope that you will uh, be able to answer some of these questions that I know that people have been asking me right along. Well, the first question I have, or the first statement I have, is last August, the legislature passed a new law that changed how older citizens receive care in their community. Now, what does that law do, and, and how does it change things? And I'll call on Al to give us the first answer. Well, Sally, it, uh, the, the bill is called the Equal Choice Law. It was signed in August uh, by then Governor Romney. Mm -hmm. And what it does basically is it gives seniors the ability to have a choice to live in the least restrictive setting, the most integrated setting that's appropriate for them. That means their home or the community. Yes. And, and the thing that's so dramatic about it, as you know, as somebody who helped us get this law, is that it, it really says to seniors, we're going to try to keep you at home first. That's your first option in this state. And it redirects really 30 years of thinking about how Medicaid spends its money. Because this state spends a lot of money, over $2 billion, that's with a B, on, on long-term care. And this, this law for the first time says we want to spend that money on you at home to keep you where you want to be. So it's, it's responsive to what elders want. Good enough. Well, and next I would like to ask, um, you've said that the new Equal Choice Law is actually a civil rights bill, and how does that uh, work? It is a civil rights bill because it, it goes back to a, a piece of federal legislation uh, that was written in 1991 called the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that law says that uh, people who are considered to be disabled, they can't do a certain thing around the house, eating, bathing, dressing, that those folks have a right to be cared for in the most integrated setting possible. This all sort of came to a head in 1999 when a U.S. Supreme Court case called the Olmstead decision came along and said that um, people who are unjustifiably segregated in nursing homes are having their civil rights violated. So now we have a law in Massachusetts that says, yes, it is, it is a violation of your civil rights to keep you in an institution when you could be at home. Good. And now, Dan, I'm going to ask you, is it really possible to keep the, someone at home as opposed to placing them in a nursing home? And how would you do it? Well, the answer is yes. Simple as that. Now, doing it on a daily basis, as you know, Sally, because you've been in this work with us for a long time, it's not easy to do it, but it is absolutely possible. And following up on what Al was saying is, is that what we've been doing a good job for 35 some odd years with the home care program. Uh, Mystic Valley Elder Services is one of 27 agencies in the state mm -hmm. um, through the Mass Home Care Association, funded primarily by the state legislature with some money from the federal government. Is We've been doing a good job at helping people remain at home. We do it in partnership with the older person themselves mm -hmm. because they're right, an active partner who's helping direct the care. They're in charge. That's one of the other parts of what Equal Choice is about, really empowering all the people. Family and friends are critically important in helping someone stay at home. And agencies like Mystic Valley through the Choices Program and the Personal Care Attendant Program, and we can talk about some of the specific programs later on, um, are doing a good job at helping people stay at home. What's really exciting about the Equal Choice Law is it says, puts us on a level playing field with institutions. So where in the past we had a very limited amount of funding available for a person to be able to stay at home. Now we're looking at some programs, particularly for low-income people through the Medicaid program, that effectively puts community care 
on an equal footing. And when I say on an equal footing, not only in terms of philosophy, but in terms of the money available, because that's what it's going to take to provide that intensive in-home care services. And we're doing it now. We're doing it across the state. And it's extremely exciting for you, me, my families. We really do now have a choice. So the answer is we absolutely can do it. It's not easy, but we do it every day. Thank you, Dan, and that's very good information. Uh, I have another question for you. And what are some of the examples of the, pro of the programs that exist today here in Massachusetts in keeping people out of nursing homes? Perfect follow-up question. Uh, let's get right down to it, right, and keep people at home. The first thing I guess I would like to say is the viewers should call 1-800-A-G-E-I-N-F-O. That's 1-800-AGE-INFO and then press 3. That's a statewide toll-free number that will get a caller to the agency who can help them all across Massachusetts. So that's the number one thing. Make the phone call. Because when you call in, what I would say to you and your viewers is the important thing is to say how, what we should be saying to the consumers, how can we help you? Sure. Tell us what it is you need. My job and the job of the people who work for Mystic Valley and the other race, aging service access point agencies is what we're called across the state. Our job is then to help you figure out with you what's the right program. There are a plethora of programs all good different programs that the legislature and the federal government have created over the last 35 years that help people. And there are some nuances to the different programs. And we could probably spend four hours this afternoon or this evening talking about all the different guidelines. But ultimately, our job is to help figure, figure out with you what's going to make sense. They basically fall into three different categories. P programs that are designed to help people who are on MassHealth or Medicaid remain in the community. Programs for people who are low to moderate income, which meet state guidelines that are above Medicaid, but are below what we would call upper middle class or, or, or wealthy folks. And then there are programs for everyone, regardless of income um, or circumstance. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Under the Mass Health Program, we have Community Choices, Personal Care Attendant Program, Group Adult Foster Care, Adult Family Care, all programs designed to help people who are primarily nursing home eligible and meet mass health guidelines. Then we have programs called the state home care program, respite programs, programs for caregivers, basic in-home services for people with incomes, individuals of approximately less than $22,000 a year or about $30,000 for a couple income. And then we have programs, home delivered meals programs, congregate dining site programs, information programs, programs for caregivers for people, any resident of the Commonwealth, and we're lucky to live in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has a very rich array of services that are available for families and caregivers regardless of income. So we have a, a broad range of things. I should say. Well, thank you. That is good information. Thank you. And now for Al, uh, what is this new nursing home pre-admission program, and how does it work? Well, part of the Equal Choice Law uh, is a requirement now that everyone who's seeking care in a nursing home uh, have a sit-down conversation with an expert in the field of community-based care for the purpose of explaining to them what their options might be uh, living in the community. Because a lot of folks go into nursing homes without really knowing what the alternative was. Mm. And that's too bad um, because it's very expensive to go into a nursing home and people who have saved up a little bit of money are going to spend it very quickly. Uh, on nursing home care and find themselves pretty much impoverished. Sure. So the idea is to get it right for the first time before you need nursing home care, find out what the options are. So the Commonwealth is putting together a what they call a counseling and assessment program on a pre-admission basis. That means in the hospitals, in the community, workers like those at Mystic Valley Elder Services will be in hospitals uh, meeting with people uh, whose doctor is saying to them, uh, I want your mom to consider a nursing home, instead of just making that an automatic decision, uh, uh, organizations like Mystic Valley Elder Services will be uh, doing an assessment of whether, in fact, that makes sense. And if there's a community program that can keep you at home, that's what we're going to be recommending so that people go into this with their eyes wide open about what their options are. So it's an exciting, we're doing this now in nursing homes. You know, we're in nursing homes now bringing people out to the community. In fact, we have 
10,000 people, Sally, who are nursing home eligible, living in the community, mm -hmm. saving the Commonwealth more than $400 million a year by keeping them in the community. Now we're going to be in hospitals and, and in other settings doing the same thing to make sure that only the people who really need to be in a nursing home uh, end up there. Well, that's good information. Yeah. I do have another question for you. I understand that there's a new program that allows family members to be paid a, a fee, or a caregiver's fee, uh, for taking care of their, their, their uh, elders at home. Now, how does that program work? Yeah, there's actually several programs now in the Commonwealth just uh, within the past uh, year or so that uh, actually allow uh, family members to be paid as caregivers. This is very exciting. Yes. Um, it was uh, about a year ago, April of 2006, that the Commonwealth allowed for the first time the so-called personal care attendant program oh, yes. to pay sons and daughters to be caregivers. Now, this is the program. Mm -hmm. There's about 20,000 people in this program now. Most of them are non-elderly. They're usually younger individuals with disabilities. But the personal care attendant program allows me, you, to hire someone, could be a son or a daughter, to provide for our care. Mm -hmm. The one limitation is you have to be on Mass Health Medicaid to qualify for that, but it's a wonderful program mm -hmm. and many seniors don't know about it. So that's one program. Sure. Then we also have the program called Adult Foster Care, which does the same thing, but in this case, the elder lives, moves in with a daughter or the daughter moves in with, I say daughter because most of the caregivers are daughters, <laughs> right. you know that. True. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the family member has the elder come live with them and they can be paid as much as $18,000 a year plus room and board. So it actually comes out to around $24,000 a year, which is not a great deal of money, but at least it's enough to allow a daughter to say, you know what, I'm going to step out of the workforce for a few years to take care of my mom uh, while she's uh, you know, failing uh, so that she can remain living in a, a home environment mm -hmm. rather than an institution. Because I can't tell you how many families call us and say, please tell me some way that I can keep mom at home because I don't want her to be in the regimented world of a nursing home where she loses a lot of privacy and dignity. So those are exciting new options that we didn't have a year ago. Sure, and I think it's so important for the elderly to stay at home and be in the familiar environment and also uh, I, I believe that they live longer and healthier and uh, the, the fact that they're at home and not disturbed and moved into a facility where they know no one and feel strange, I think uh, really makes them um, feel as though uh, they've lost their independence and so I think uh, the will to live too I yeah, mean I've absolutely. had people tell me that uh, my mom went downhill as soon as she uh, left her home because she just had no longer the will to, to carry on and I, yes. I think you're absolutely right being right. at home is much more comforting and better for their health and now for Dan I mean yes I know that uh, most of these programs are for people who don't have very much people who are on uh, mass health or Medicaid but what do we have for people who are not in that um, financial situation? Right. Well, Sally, as I mentioned a minute ago, there are, as I see it, there are really three categories. And I think one of the things that um, may be a bit of a myth is that there is nothing for people who are not, quote, poor, unquote. Sure. Um, clearly, there are programs designed to help those who have the least means. And those are the folks who are on the Mass Health Medicaid program. But I would say that we have been fortunate, again, to live here in the Commonwealth, and other states don't have these kind of programs, some do, some don't, where the, the Commonwealth is providing funding for people who are, we'll call, near poor. Um, everybody has a different definition of what sure. is poor and what is not poor. But I, I would say somebody who is in the Commonwealth uh, making less than $22,000 a year, in my opinion, is not wealthy, particularly when you think about trying to maintain a home maybe paying real estate taxes, uh, heating oil, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there are programs for people who are under $22,000 a year, which the, mass, the state legislature and the governor are providing uh, that we're administering. So that allows folks to get a certain amount of home care services. There are other programs in Mystic Valley and most of the agencies as part of mass home care, as we're private not-for-profit agencies, we do a lot more than what the state or the federal government provides for because we have people, local people like yourself on our boards of directors and, my, and those of us who work in the business realize that there are folks who are $22,001. Uh, the, 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 the person I call a dollar, there's always a person who's $1 over the income limit in any program when you have an income limit. 
And those folks by no means are wealthy and able to take care of themselves. You know, if you're the Kennedys or the Rockefellers, um, you're going to be able to take care of yourself. But there are, those are relatively few and far between those families. So you have all of these folks who live in the towns of Reading and the North Shore and across the state who are getting by, but they're only getting by for the sake of one disaster befalls them. And a disaster could be a health disaster in many cases. Sure. So agencies like Mr. Gale and the other agencies are doing some private fundraising. We work with families, we partner, we'll provide whether you have grants or scholarships for caregivers. Families pay a portion of the, um, the, the services. Mystic Valley and the other agencies will provide for some of the service. I'll give you an example where a family member may be, want to go to a daycare program, an adult day health program. Um, day health, fantastic buy for about $50, $60, $70 a day, depending on the program. You're there for the whole day, you get uh, activities, supervision, nursing, meals, etc. Now, I say it's a great buy, but if you're doing that five days a week, that can add up. But an agency like Mystic Valley may work with the family and say, we can, through our funding sources, we can provide two days a week. The elder may be able to afford a day, the family goes two days. Sure. So we work together in partnership. Well, that's good. Um, to try to piece together a care plan that's going to make sense. So I think it's very important for people in the Commonwealth to think not to rule themselves out. That's why I said a few minutes ago, make the phone call. Sure. Because one of the tragedies, and I've, and I've been in this, like you and Al, for, for many years, it's, it's our life work. Um, and one of the things that I hear time and time again is somebody will say, after the fact, I wish I had known. I didn't realize. Only if. So if there's one message we can get out today is to try to make those what ifs, I wish I had, fewer. So make the phone call because people would be surprised at the innovation and the availability of programs that they really may have no idea about. So don't rule yourself out. Take the chance, make the phone call. I tell people it's a free call, 1-800, right. and there's going to be no pressure to sell you. It's going to be how can we help you. Well, that's very good advice, and I know that so many people feel that they won't qualify, they're not able to get help, and so they're afraid to make that phone call. Mm -hmm. But I think if they just did and then try to find out if they can qualify or if they can get the help they need, right. I think they'll be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, the system's not perfect, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you today that everybody is going to be 100% right. satisfied. I wish I could say that. Al and I and you and other advocates are working to make that satisfaction, if you will, level go up. Absolutely. But I think on the whole, we're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. We're doing better, mm -hmm. and we will do better in the future. Sure. You know, that reminds me of the, um, the circuit breaker um, credit, tax mm -hmm. credit. Mm -hmm. So many people feel they don't qualify, and so they right. don't even try to do the math. And it's sad because they're leaving five, six, seven hundred dollars a year on the table. Right, right. And yeah, that I could help tremendously to provide a home care service or right. I think it's fuel or whatever. Uh, I believe that the tax credit can be as high as eight hundred seventy-five dollars. Yeah, that's somewhere. where it is now, but not. It's even more, Sally, because you can retroactively apply for three years. That's right. And believe me, that's right. This is mm -hmm. one program that people don't know about. They, yes. if they've even heard that there's a, a tax credit for this year, uh, they don't know it applies two years back, and they oh. think that well. A lot of seniors think, well, I don't pay much in, in state tax because my Social Security isn't taxed. Sure. They don't realize that it's a credit. You can have zero taxes that right. you owe right. and still get a check back from the Commonwealth. That's right. My mother-in-law gets one, sure. and I, I filled it out for her because sure. you know most people are not going to know that. And the, a lot of tax preparers don't Absolutely. even know that. That's right. It's so true. I know um, many people have encouraged to do the math and found out, yes, they do qualify and, right. and have been able to get their, their credit. So we hope more people will pay attention and make that call and exactly. or try that math and uh, see if they can uh, benefit by it, and I'm sure they will. I have another question for you, uh, Dan. Uh, how many elder people uh, are now in nursing homes, and how are we preparing for the baby boomers? Okay, well, I... I to my knowledge, Alan can help me out on this, this statewide perspective. I think there are some 30, 35 to 40,000 people still in, uh, residing in nursing homes statewide. Yeah, it's, a, it's around that, 35,000 maybe on mass health. Most, most people in these institutions are on mass health. Right. Okay. And that's, there's probably. It's falling. The number is falling. falling. Yeah. Sure. Uh, which is a good thing. Um, and 
a part of that, a good deal of that, is due to the uh, programs that we've been talking about today uh, sure. in terms of providing more options for folks uh, to remain in the community. Um, the, clearly, the, uh, the number of people who will need services, as you mentioned, Sally, the baby boomers, people like me, uh, and Al, who's a younger guy. Right. Um, you know, we're going to, hopefully we're going to live well, and I think most of us are going to live longer, it seems to be the case, and hopefully we're going to live uh, a healthier lifestyle. Sure. And few, uh, hopefully fewer of us will need services earlier. Now, having sure. said all that, there are going to be folks uh, in our generation who are going to need services, no question about that. Sure. So I think the, the challenge is, is to try to make the programs accessible to folks like me and Al and our families and your families in a way that makes sense, that promote independence, promote a partnership. Um, personally, I think we all have a responsibility to help ourselves. That's part of being independent. Um, our families are going to participate in that. I see no evidence to suggest that that won't be the case. Sure. Sometimes I hear people say, well, if we provide these kind of services, the families will walk away. I've been in the business for over 30 years. The more programs we provide, the more help we provide, I see a strengthening of families. I don't see families walking away. In fact, what we provide, I think, helps families stay involved longer and better. So that's what we have to promote is a partnership between the recipients, the families, friends, and the formal caregiving system. And I think that's the only way it could possibly work. Um, we have People we're going to need, you know, they've talked about the, the workforce shortage. Sure. Um, so these kind of programs that Al mentioned a few minutes ago where daughters, and we both say this respectfully, sons as well, sure. uh, could be doing it as caregivers. This is where families are going to have to remain involved. There simply will not be enough caregivers in the, in the system uh, to take care of us. Sure. Um, so we need to be flexible and understand how can we balance work, family, and caregiving whether you're caregiving for your mother and or your children. Sure. Uh, and th these are the kind of things that we're, we're working and struggling with now in order to, so that when in 10, 20, 30 years, we'll be prepared for it. It won't come as a surprise. Sure. The, the other piece of it is, and I'll throw it back to you and Al, is in home care, one of the things our agencies are constantly thinking about and working on is you, in my, you can't provide home care unless people have a decent quality place to live. So we also need to think about appropriate housing options for people. And that's an, a major initiative because we have this enormous amount of housing where people, we're trying to help people stay at home, but then how do we make that in such a way so that you can get services and then in the future, if the, the current place you're living is not the place you want to be or appropriate, how do you move to another place that you want to live in that's not necessarily a nursing home? So we need to think about all of these Period. aspects of caregiving. Actually, the work that we do today and bills that we pass today are going to benefit uh, people who become seniors for Absolutely. generations to come. Right. And we I have think, a self-interest in it. Right. And, and it's the same. I have children and my children are the baby boomers as mm -hmm. you are. Right. And uh, they're in the same age bracket. And I, I think that we're making it easier for them uh, by doing the work that we're doing today. And uh, one thing that um, uh, I, I've always marveled at is um, so many young people feel that uh, senior issues are not their interest, and but actually it, senior issues should be their interest because they're going to have uh, senior issues to be um, um, concerned about, whether it's a family member, mm -hmm. an elderly parent, uh, an elderly aunt or uncle, or, or their own siblings. Uh, they're all going to get there someday. We hope. And Yes, you hope. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they have to know what's out there for them and, and the benefits of uh, looking into uh, these various programs that are going to help them. Or even, even a disabled relative, someone yes. who maybe has multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's. It, it, you know, we're dealing now with people, we're trying to look at, at people uh, based on what their need is, not their age. Uh, and so we're really trying to forge new alliances with uh, groups that are working with uh, individuals who are disabled uh, to try to make sure that we have this commitment to, the, to choice, to keep people in the community. We don't really care how old they are. No. And so every family has a long-term care story. You can stop, yes. uh, for example, when I'm on Beacon Hill lobbying, I can stop any legislator and start talking about home care and within a minute or two of the conversation, they're telling me about their, their sister or their aunt or their uncle 
right. who was kept out of a nursing home or who went into a nursing home. I mean, this is a common human condition. Absolutely. We all are dealing with this. Right. Right. So why don't we deal with it intelligently because we can keep two people at home for the price of one in a nursing home. So why don't we make our money work smarter? I mean, we've got lawmakers telling us every year how tight money is, mm -hmm. and yet we continue to, to wastefully spend our money in inappropriate settings that, that elders don't even want uh, when we could be keeping them at home. So it, it's right. not only just good policy, it's good finances as well. And I really truly believe our legislators can relate to elder issues. Absolutely. They've, they've had it in their own families yep. day after day. Right, they sure they have. They may not want to admit it, but they, they have the same problems other people have. Sure, absolutely. I, I, that's one reason I, I think that um, the silver legislators had a great deal of support from mm -hmm. uh, our legislators because they can relate to the needs of the elderly and disabled. Right. And uh, I've, I've found that they've been most supportive in that, in that area. So if we oh, hope... Oh, the Silverhead Legislature, which you're a leader in, the President of the Senate, has been extraordinarily helpful. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, well, absolutely, uh, credit where credit is due, because I think you speak and, and your colleagues and, and, and members are, are talking from real, real world experience and from the heart. Um, right. You're telling them really the way it is back in the district. Sure. And I think that's why it's been so effective. Sure. And every time I've asked Sally Hoyt to go and lobby, you've done it. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, you deserve a lot of credit because there's nobody in that building who's going to challenge you on elderly issues because you, you know, you've got the experience. And I'm and, one and myself. Information. <laughs> and you're, and you're <laughs> a senior, a and you can legend, tell. Oh, you're giving away a secret now. No, I, I never give away my age. Sixty? <laughs> you know, well, maybe. No. Anyway. I think the um, the secret is to be happy and to keep busy and to do the things you enjoy doing. Uh, I think that really um, gives you the um, the feeling that you've accomplished something because you're you're able to get out there and do those things just like mm -hmm. any young person. So I remember serving on the board of selectmen that um, one of my um, uh, colleagues uh, uh, said to me, Sally, where do you get that energy? And I always say to them, I don't know, I think I'm inherited, it's inherited because everyone in my family is, is energetic. and yeah, uh, it's genetic. And it it's is. I, I, I think yeah. it is a gene mm -hmm. because every member of my family is like me, or, or I'm like them, but mm -hmm. we're all, um, you know, busy people and we enjoy doing the things that we do. That's I think right. everybody has it, everybody has that gene in them. Yes. Some people do a better job at bringing right. it out. It has to and be developed. It has to be developed. And, and we have to find and an we interest. we need more <laughs> Sally Hoyts. We need oh, more advocates. You. We really do. Thank you. And I have a question now for Al. Mm. Um, we've asked the Governor, pa uh, Governor Patrick to, um, to take his money that's, uh, being, as a, that is there for uh, the elderly and for nursing homes and for home care. And we've asked him to, uh, to uh, divide it 50-50 um, fifty percent into nursing homes and fifty percent into uh, the home care. Now, do other states do that, or how can we be sure that we can get our fifty percent for each? Well, actually, uh, in this regard, other states are way ahead of us. One of the uh, best places that I recommend to people, if they're growing old and they want a state that really gets it, they should go to Oregon, which spends basically about sixty-six percent of its long-term care money on care at home and only 33% in the nursing home. So that's the reverse of us. Well, of course. Yeah, so they're way ahead of us, and they've been doing this since the early 1980s. And these are states, Oregon, Washington, Wisconsin, other states have been very uh, forward-looking in thinking about what you were raising earlier about the baby boomers and where we're going. Because if Massachusetts doesn't start to get it right soon, all of a sudden lawmakers are gonna be on Beacon Hill saying, you know, we're overwhelmed with all these people who have become, who are now getting into the 70s and 80s, um, we didn't plan for them. Uh, we, we used to warehouse people in nursing homes, and that was to, proved to be very costly and, and undesirable. So now what do we do? Well, this is exactly the time now in 2007 when we should be answering those questions affirmatively, keep people at home. Because as we said earlier, uh, other states are, have already done it, and it's going to bankrupt us if we don't get it right. So that's why uh, I can tell people Massachusetts has been a leader in the home care field. But today, if you ask me, are we spending our money smart in a smart way and in the right place, my answer would be not yet. But sure. we're getting there with, with sure. uh, a lot of hard work. We're getting there. Sure. And we have to work harder still. We're not done. Right. 
Now, and Al, again, uh, what about uh, the elderly and disabled who are in nursing homes? How do we get the message to them that, that they have a choice and they can re uh, come back home and uh, be able to receive home care services? Well, anyone in a nursing home, I don't care how they got there or who's paying their bill, anyone in a nursing home, uh, can uh, have one of their family members or themselves pick up that phone that Dan talked about and call that 1-800-AGE-INFO and they can ask, if they press 3, they ask to speak to the person who does uh, work in the nursing home to help relocate people. Um, uh, Dan's agency, Mystic Valley All the Services and uh, all the uh, other uh, 26 agencies across the state, mm -hmm. they all have workers who are going through nursing homes mm -hmm. um, then, and they're doing assessments of people on an ongoing basis. So if there's somebody in a nursing home who's not happy there, who feels that they could be back home, uh, and they're not t asking either the nursing home uh, uh, nurses or, or orderlies, I want to go home and I'd like to talk to somebody about going home. They, should make, they have to make some noise about it. Sure. If they're just quiet and they say nothing and, and they're just thinking, I'm not happy here, They'll, they'll stay there, but it, they need to speak out. They need to speak to our people. There's a nursing home ombudsman who comes around. Oh, yeah. Any of these people, the 800 age info, the ombudsman, yeah. our care managers, any of those people mm -hmm. will sit down and talk with them about what would be necessary. Now, not everyone can come home, right. but there's a lot of people who, who can. Sure. We don't That's want so to over prom, over deliver it, right. um, but we, we, we do want to hear from anybody who's feeling that this is not the right place for me. Sure. Yeah. That, that's absolutely uh, true. I, ca I can't emphasize uh, enough what Al's saying is, is so important that right. all our agencies across the state in every single nursing, long-term care facility nursing home in the state, there are people going in, mm -hmm. as Al said, either ombudsman or folks from our staff, nurses, case managers, mm -hmm. whose purpose is to help meet resident needs. The other thing that I, I should also add is that People in nursing homes, long-term care facilities, should not overlook telling the nursing home that they would like help relocating. Sure. There are nursing home uh, discharge planners and, and administrators, and part of their job, mm -hmm. and, and there are many good people who work in nursing homes. These are frontline workers who are doing, you know, they say God's work, just as much as the frontline workers yeah. in the community. They're wonderful people. Sure. And Sure, there are maybe a bad actor here and there, but for the most part, these are good, good, caring people. And so people should tell the, tell the, the, the people who are working in these nursing homes, that, which are in effect the home for these mm -hmm. pe people, um, that they would like a different home. Sure. And how can they help them make that connection to the community? Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to overlook the staff who work in the long-term care facilities as a source uh, and ha have the responsibility to help their residents, patients, clients. Sure. I think it's very important that we get the message out because so many of them have no idea that they have a choice. That's right. Right. That's right. right. And the family may have resigned themselves that this is where mom is going to be the rest of her life. We're trying to get the message out that nursing homes are not your last address, that uh, you, have, you still have options. I don't care how old you are. You still have options. You should be exploring those. And some people who go into a nursing home uh, after a few months are ready to come back out. We oh, yes. need to make sure that the the understanding is is that um, life is not a conveyor belt that mm -hmm. only goes in one direction. Right. That sometimes people go into these facilities and come back out. Maybe they go in a second time. Maybe they get hospitalized. Right. But life is dynamic, and it, at all times and at all settings, you should have your independence and your dignity and your privacy. I don't care Certainly. what the title is over the door or where you are. Your privacy and your dignity is your right, and you should fight for that no matter where you are and no matter how old you are, make sure that you continue to get your privacy and your dignity. Sure. One of the things that people, um, I think, again, assume is that they go into a nursing home and they have to give up their home or their apartment. Yes. Um, and so they feel like, it, as Al said, I'm on the conveyor belt and the conveyor belt goes one way and now I'm in a nursing home and I have no other place to go. Um, that's not true because we mentioned a little while ago that we talked about these programs like the uh, per adult family care program and group adult foster care and some of these other programs that where an older person will go live with a family member or even go live with another family, a foster family, if you will. And so the, the, if the thinking is, I don't have my home to go back to, therefore I cannot leave the nursing home, it's not true. No. There are other good quality living options Yes. Whether you're living with someone else or whether you're moving to a, a maybe an assisted living facility or a supportive housing program, 
that are now cropping up across the state in public housing programs. So again, I think the message we both want to get across is sure. there are options. Right. They're not, it's not easy, it's not A, B, C, D, boom. No. But that's why agencies like Mystic Valley and the people we have are care advisors, if uh, that's really maybe the better term than a case manager. These are really professional people who are there to help assist you, the consumer, yeah. to figure out how do we meet your preferences? Sure. Not how do we do, how do you do what we want you to do? Right. We want to help you get what you need and want. And the key, yes. No, go ahead. The, the, I think the key to it all is there are alternatives. They there don't are. have to remain in a nursing home if they choose to come out and, and be in another facility. Right. I'll, I'll, if I can just give you one quick example. We had this, a case in point a husband and wife who lives in our jurisdiction. Uh, and recently, the, the husband had Alzheimer's disease. The caregiver, the, the, his wife, uh, had a series of medical problems. They both ended up in the nursing home. And effectively, everybody, the whole system, if you will, was saying to them, you, you, that's it, you, you cannot come home. The, uh, the person with the, the older gentleman had Alzheimer's disease. He was a heavy care. He was having difficulty ambulating. Mm. Uh, he was on a feeding tube. The caregiver, the wife, was ha had congestive heart failure, lots of medical problems. But she was bound and determined to come home. And frankly, over a lot of advice that it was not safe for her to go home, mm. that couple is now home. Wonderful. And they're, provi they're getting services from Mystic Valley. They're private paying. Fortunately, they have some means, so they're actually providing care. But here, here are two people who are doing well. They're, doing, they're happy to be in, back in their apartment. And frankly, had this been two, three, four years ago, I would, I'm sad to say I would almost guarantee you they would not have been able to come home. Really? But they knew they had options. Sure. And they, and they, took, they were assertive and said, and they had family members who were involved with this who also provided a tremendous amount of support and who are strong advocates. But it's working. Sure. And there's also a place in Reading, uh, well, there may be more than one place because it's assisted living um, homes also, but Peter Sanborn Place here in Reading mm -hmm. is a great alternative for people yep. who need to, uh, well, they're in a facility where they have their privacy, their own little apartment, right. but they also have um, the care from, um, I believe it comes from Mr. Valley. Yeah, basically and I would put that in the category of what we call these supportive living programs, yes, where right. you're independent, but there are services available if and when you need them. Right. And it's just a, um, it's so logical, it's so sort of, why didn't we think of this before? Sure. But that's the future, well, is where people have the ability to get the services they need when they need them. Sure, well I've heard of the residents telling me that um, and they're, they're just so pleased that they're able to have those benefits by living at Peter mm -hmm. Sanborn. So there's so many uh, um, uh, various uh, options for them if they do want to live in a, uh, a home or a uh, residential facility. Right. And remember, Sally, we're now allowing people to hire their own workers. Yes. And in some cases, we, we will soon be allowing people to manage their own budget. You know, they'll be given a certain amount of money and they will decide what to do with that money in terms of services that they want to buy. Right. So it's called self-directed care where you hire your own worker and also a program called cash and counseling where you're given a budget and you work with someone who advises you about how to best use that money. So we're trying to put more power in the hands of the consumer, sure. less power in the hands of the provider sure. because it's the consumer's money. These tax dollars should be benefiting the people who paid into the system and helping them live independently with dignity. And that's, that's where we're heading. You know, I, I've heard of that program, and, and they, they can have um, a, a son or daughter or, or yep. a family member or a grandchild care for them, and uh, they can be trained as well. Mm -hmm. And how does the training part uh, come in? I mean, uh, what service do we have that gives them the training? Well, in, in the personal care attendant program, for example, it's a combination of the, the, uh, the elder or the disabled individual themselves training their worker to take care of them the way they want to be cared for. I see. So they will train them and then they have access to a skills trainer who works with the elder to talk about, you, you know, you, if you need help with eating or bathing and dressing, how is it that you want that done? So that they can just articulate to the worker, this is how I want this to be done. And the great thing about that program is it's very flexible. The, the state isn't overseeing them 
telling them, don't feed them this way or don't hand them their medicines. Believe me, we have so many ridiculous rules that, that govern some of our services that actually talk about how you can feed somebody, that you can't put uh, a medicine in their mouth, just all kinds of little uh, limitations and cubby mm -hmm. holes that we put people sure. into. Programs like Personal Care Tenant are much more uh, family oriented and family like and mm -hmm. that's the model that we need to go for yes. is an informal family caregiver because that's where most of our care is provided anyway in this country sure. by family members who are just doing it because they want to keep their loved one at home. Well, that, that's a great alternative too. Yeah. I, I, would, I would prefer to see that. It's part of most of the care that we provide. Oh, Without sure. the family members it wouldn't, it wouldn't hold together. I think you need a, a, a menu of services because as, as great as that program is uh, it puts a lot of onus and responsibility uh, on the older person and or the, the family members. Sure. And there are certain instances where a family member, or there may not be family members available to help out in terms of overseeing that, or the older person may simply choose not to want to, to get down to that level of hiring and managing their own worker. And so we have what I would call the other traditional system where you come through an agency like Mystic Valley and we use paid caregivers who are coming through agencies. And one, in my opinion, is not necessarily better than the other. Sure. It, it's, it's sort of, a, I guess, uh, I was going to, I used to use the analogy of the, serv the, the gas station where you could go pull up to either the full service pump or the self service pump. Yes. Now, we don't have much full service anymore, but if you wanted, for those of us who remember that, you could go to the full service pump and pay a couple of pennies more and get the gas pumped and windshield washed, or you could go and save a little bit of money and, and pump it yourself. Sure. One was not necessarily better than the other. Sometimes it worked, you know, in different circumstances. And I think that's what we want to do is to provide, again, different options, quality. All of it has to be quality. We don't want to provide a two-tiered system of poor quality care for some and good quality care for others. What we want to provide is a series of good quality care options. And sometimes that can be where the person is hiring, directing their own worker. or and there are other circumstances where you're going through an agency and somebody is taking care of the management of the care and you are the recipient. So I think, again, in whatever we do, we always want to make certain that we're giving people not only choices, but we're giving them good quality choices. Absolutely. Not a choice between good or, and poor. No. That's not a choice. No, that is not a choice. I have one question that um, I've had asked of me and that is when a person is at home and receiving a care, you know, through your services, how can you be sure that um, the people uh, who are coming into your home are not going to pick up things that they shouldn't touch and, or walk off with valuables? And, and how do you protect your, your, mm -hmm. um, your things in your home that um, are valuable to you, may not have a monetary value, but certainly are important to you, and, and these are things you've accumulated over a lifetime, perhaps pieces of jewelry sure. and so forth. How do you protect against um, that sort of thing? Well, I can, I'll take um, a shot at this one. It's a very serious issue. Yeah. And there's probably nothing in life that's more personal than when a person comes into your home and is taking care of your personal needs. So we're talking about the most sensitive interpersonal relations and the truth of the matter is I'd like to be able to tell you that we can guarantee that nothing ill towards would ever happen but we're dealing with human beings sure. you know so there is always a certain amount of risk now having said that agencies like mine and other agencies in the state as well as the agencies that hire homemakers and then even if you're hiring your own worker you have to interview people uh, find out about their background. We all do criminal background checks on people. Yes. yes. People are bonded, they're trained, they're supervised. So that really what we're trying to do, number one, is to hire a good quality person. You want to hire people who have good character, number one. You want to hire people who are caring, who you, you get a sense that they care about the people. It's more than just a job. It's something that people aspire to and, and have a f good feeling that they're helping another human being. Sure. And then you want to be clear and direct with them about what the expectations are, what the supervision is, and what the consequences are if they misbehave, if you will. Sure. 
Now, having said all that, again, I can't guarantee you that in every single interpersonal human interaction, there's never going to be a problem. True. But knock on this nice wood table, mm -hmm. in 35 years we've had very, very few problems. Sure. But you are going to encounter problems when you're dealing with human beings. Sure. So I would say, it, sort of in, in summary, we try to do our best to bring people to your home that are of good character. I would say from a, an older person's standpoint in the family is don't leave money out laying around. No. You know, d you don't have to put every single picture or piece of jewelry away, but use common sense. Sure. And if there is a problem, let the agency, let an agency like mine know immediately. One of the sad things is, and we've had, we've, if something is missing, immediately the person coming into the home is accused of stealing it. What we find in nine out of 10 cases, and I've done this myself, so it's not a, a knock on all the people, is I put it somewhere and I can't find it. But that doesn't mean don't report it. Say, I'm missing something, a piece of jewelry, and, let's, and then we go and see if we can find it. If we can't, then we're gonna follow up, and if it comes right down to it, we'll prosecute through the, sure. through the uh, criminal justice system. The other thing is that, to, to keep in mind for, for older folks is that the people who work for Mystic Valley, for example, and the other ASAPs, Aging Services Access Points, they're called care managers. And their job is to go into the home and figure out what you need and then buy it for you. Mm -hmm. But they don't work for the same agency as the homemaker who comes into your home. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if, a, if an elder is unhappy with their homemaker, they don't like them, they don't relate well together, they call their care manager and say to the care manager, uh, this just isn't working and I, I want another person. The care manager will do that because they don't have any financial tie to the person who's in their home. So it's not, it's not an insult to the care right. manager. That's They're right. not accusing the care manager of anything. The care manager's job is to advocate for the elder. Right. Sure. So th they're perfectly happy to say, look, if this isn't working out, I will find you another person. So it's important to see the distinction because sure. some people will call me and say, um, I, you know, uh, I'm very happy with my girl, but they don't know who my girl works for. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it's not the same agency as the mm -hmm. care manager. Mm -hmm. So it's important for the family and the elder to know who's coming into their home. They have been criminal checked to get into the home. Um, and that the care manager is not the same as the homemaker and that they're different roles. And the care manager is right. there to make sure that the homemaker is doing the job that the senior wants to have done. So they have that protection. If they're really unhappy, they can file a complaint with uh, something called the Community Care Ombudsman. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, there, there are protections for people. Well, that's good to hear, right. especially if people are bonded. Not that you want things stolen and, and exactly. recover money. Right. But, but again, I think the, the uh, you know, I've seen coming back to the same issue, make the phone call. Because again, sometimes people, as Al said, they may think, well, what's the point? I'm reluctant. I don't want to get, quote, somebody in trouble. But if there's something bothering you as the, as the person who is getting the care, you need to let your care manager sure. know about that. Because most of the time we can resolve it sure. satisfactorily. Everybody ends up happy. When it's the rare occurrence where there is a problem, we want to know about that because you, the, care, the person, the recipient, should not be exploited. Sure. Sally, every day in this state, there are 43 new reports of elder abuse. And do you know that most of them come from family or friends? So unfortunately, mm -hmm. the unfortunate fact is, is that the most problems happen inside a family sure. where people are not treating each other right. But the good news is that we have a program for that as well called Protective mm -hmm. Services. Mm -hmm. So if anybody out there is suffering from any kind of financial exploitation, they think someone's taking money from them in the family, or physical abuse or mental abuse, abuse people being denied care, or even someone who's not taking care of themselves, self-neglect. They're walking around the house very poorly dressed, the mm -hmm. house isn't heated, there's no food in the refrigerator. Any of it these happens. kinds of things should be reported to the protective agency. And again, there, there's that 800 number to get you into the system. Mm -hmm. uh, those, those, those complaints, those reports will be investigated. Sure. And, and, and so we have protections in place for people who are suffering from abuse at the hands, sometimes, unfortunately, of, of relatives or friends. Well, I think it's good to hear that we have safeguards in place mm -hmm. and that people are protected in so many ways. Right. Yeah. Well, not 100 percent, but not there's always problems. But right. Sure. Now, I have um, 
I, uh, an issue that uh, I've been working on for a long time. Um, I filed legislation to try to repeal it, and that is the user fee that uh, private patients are being charged in, uh, in uh, nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And many of the um, family members have no idea that um, this 11, well, it, it increases every year. So right now it's $11 a day plus so many cents. But um, it's factored into their daily charges, and you can imagine if you did your math, eleven plus dollars a day amounts to more than four thousand dollars a year in Massachusetts state taxes. But that's not called a tax; it's called a user fee, which means even if they knew that they were charged this fee um, on a daily basis, they they cannot take it as a tax deduction because it's a fee and not a tax when actually I call it a tax. Mm -hmm. But what I know, I have filed legislation now, this is my uh, uh, third year, because I, I filed it two years ago and uh, we almost made it. Uh, Senator mm -hmm. um, Sue, uh, Sue Tucker from uh, mm -hmm. Andover mm -hmm. had it all uh, squared away for me. Mm -hmm. uh, she and her committee, I have to give her committee a great deal of uh, credit for it. But they come last July 1st, it would have been phased out in three years so that it would not have been a burden to anyone. And uh, so we had come to that and then it got stuck in the Health Care Financing Committee and just died at the end of the year. And so um, after, after going so far and, and being right there at the point where we were repealing it and um, with the help of the um, Elder, uh, elder um, Committee, yep that uh, Elder Affairs Committee, that um, it, it just uh, didn't make it. And, and I, I think that was a travesty because why should um, people in, in nursing homes pay this tax or fee when they're paying enough um, for their care in a nursing home? They're not a burden to the Commonwealth and their, their family members are paying for their care right out of their own pocket. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to get more support? Because I refiled it this year, mm -hmm. and so it is there, and uh, I'll be supporting it again, for, mm -hmm. that is supporting the repeal. Right. And hopefully, I know that, I, I have seen this year especially, uh, and not only did I file the bill, but many legislators have filed the same bill. So it seems to me that more people are aware now that uh, there is a, a, a fee in these daily charges and it shouldn't be there. In so fact, there was, a hearing, there was a hearing on this recently. Uh, on, the, we, on Beacon Hill, it's called the bed tax. The bed tax. Yeah, it may not be a common term out in the public, but they call it the bed tax, which I is see. what it is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a form of double taxation because the, the, the private pay people who are paying that tax um, also through their, their taxes are helping to pay for the Medicaid program, which of course is one of the major underwriters of nursing home care to begin with. So they're already paying their taxes, which go to Medicaid, and on top of it, they pay a second tax because they happen to be sick and in a healthcare institution, which means that the only people who pay it are people who are infirm, which right away uh, strikes me as a, an unfair situation. It's a sick tax, if you will, on people who happen to be disabled enough that they need nursing home care. Um, what I don't understand is why, if we're going to pay for nursing home care, let's all of us, including healthy taxpayers, let's all continue to, to, to foot the bill if we have to and increase our contributions that way rather than saying to people, if you have the misfortune of not being able to be kept at home but have to go into an institution, we're going to slap you with a sick tax to penalize you. If you stay home, you're, we won't charge you that, but if you go into a nursing home, we are going to charge you $4,000 extra. Right. Now, half of that money, Sally, $288 million, by the way, is raised by this tax. Half of it goes to the nursing homes, and half of it comes back to the, the uh, Treasury in Massachusetts because federal taxpayers pay for half of that. So whatever gets raised here gets matched by the federal taxpayer, I who see. is us. Oh, of course. So you see, we're, we're paying for this in a variety of ways. Right. And all of it is sort of um, economic, uh, you know, bookkeeping gimmickry to give the nursing homes more money. And again, we don't want to deny nursing homes the money they need to operate a, a quality institution. But this is not a fair form of taxation. Um, it, it singles out one kind of individual right. who's sick. And I think, I agree with you that they ought to repeal the tax and just instead raise the if they have to, the Medicaid contribution 
that's paid for by all American taxpayers, not just those who are sick. That's yeah. right. And but you know why it's not passing. Yes, I do know why okay, it's not passing. There's something called the nursing home ministry. Right. And it's a powerful lobby, and they spend right. a lot of money taking people out to dinner right. and taking, making contributions to fundraisers. So that's why Sally Hoyt doesn't have her bill, as the nursing home ministry is standing in the way of you and a piece of legislation. Well, but see, ultimately, they're, it's they're like... They're too big for me. I don't get paid. No, 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 keep, no, no, no. Because see, what you, you, know, you asked the question of what can we do, and, and what we do right now is what is part of what the uh, work, work of getting the word out to the public Educating about people. what they need to understand. And frankly, ultimately, um, if the legislators hear from their constituents across the state that this is an unfair tax, um, they're going to listen. I, I have faith in the system. I think, you know... We, we all work in the system, and we've done some good That's things, right. and we've had some obstacles, right. and we've, we've had some defeats over the years. But um, we're in this for the long haul. Right. And, um, you know, the, ultimately, if we, we keep at it, and you keep at it, and together we get a coalition of uh, consumers and advocates saying this is not the right thing to do, I'm confident the legislature will ultimately do the right thing. Well, and just as the uh, Estate Recovery Act took us, uh, I think, six years before we got that repealed. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful it won't take six years. I'm hopeful that um, this year or this term, mm -hmm. this session, we will be able to repeal that tax. But as, as you, I'm sure, remember the Estate Recovery Act, I worked darn hard to repeal that bill. And I have to say that the civil legislature really did a great job. Because yes. I, I wouldn't let up until we repealed that bill. That's right. And, um, and as you know, um, yeah, what happened was um, if a person was on uh, Medicaid or Mass Health that, um, and in a nursing home, then after the person passed away, uh, the, uh, the estate or, or uh, assets of the uh, deceased person would have a lien on them uh, mm -hmm. to recover dollar per dollar that was spent on the person who was receiving um, a help from the Commonwealth. Right. And, um, and so that was really um, a nightmare for a lot of families because they had no idea that this mm -hmm. could happen to their, to their assets. They thought it was going on to their children mm -hmm. or the children would inherit the assets of the um, person who was deceased. But um, they had to go through uh, removing the liens, and um, uh, uh, had, they had to share their inheritance with the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. and right. um, and so it became quite a nightmare. So, but we did finally repeal it. I think it took us about six years, but we did. Right. So we're hoping it won't take that long to repeal this, the uh, user tax uh, on uh, private patients in nursing homes. But that tax has got to go. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, um, do you have any further information you'd like to share with the public? And I'll just let you um, go ahead and uh, say your thing at, at this point because uh, I, I do believe that all of the questions that I had uh, for you um, have been answered and answered uh, beautifully and I'm sure the public well, has learned a great deal. I'll let Al have the last word, but from, from my last word would be, again, I, if I can just encourage the, the viewers to make the call. Yes. And they should call one 800 a G E I N F O and press three. And that phone number will connect you toll free to an agency like Mystic Valley Elder Services, no matter where you live in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So whether it's for home care services, information about long term care, housing, insurance counseling, elder protective services, that's the phone number to make the call. And make the call is sooner than later. We don't want to have people have regrets. Thank you, Dan. And now? I would just add that home care is your civil right. Go get it. You're right. It is everyone's civil right, and we should all know it. Thank you very, very much. It's, it's been a, pleasure. a very you, informative Sally. afternoon. And I've learned a lot, too. So um, it is a day of learning. And as they say, we're, it's never too late to learn Absolutely. and to know more and to be able to put these things in, into um, action. So if the public has any questions, don't hesitate to call us, and they certainly know where to find me, so um, I'm happy to be of assistance at any time. And thank you again for gracing us this afternoon with all your, your talent and information, and we certainly do appreciate it. Thank my, you very my much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.